Um, he did his PhD at the University of Twente, then he went for some time to, to, the, to Sproul in Brighton. Now he's a professor at Manchester um, and he's a professor on so system innovation and sustainability. Um, and he's one of the founding fathers of the MLP and he's, he was for many years the chairman of the board of the STRN, the Sustainability Transitions Research Network. So that's why I'm really happy today to have Frank with us today. Hi, Frank. Maybe you just want to wave again. Um, <laughs> and Frank will give us a talk on the MLP. So one of the major um, concepts and frameworks that we are actually using in sustainability transitions research. Um, it's one amongst others, but it's one of the ones that has been used and developed very much further over the last, yeah, almost yeah, 20 years, 18 years. Um, in the email that you got, uh, we said that Frank would talk actually about the micro foundations and Frank just published a paper on the micro foundations of the MLP, but we agreed or he suggested that he would actually give a very uh, broad overview of the MLP. So um, I love this sentence, which is no further ado. So with no further ado, please, we'll hand over to Frank. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us today, Frank. Thanks very much for the introduction, Julius, and uh, <clears throat> also to Nest for the invitation to speak through this webinar. So uh, I've been asked to give a general presentation about uh, social technical transitions and the multi-level perspective in particular. Uh, and I'll talk about basic concepts and new research streams. So I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. And I agree with Julius that if I talk too long that he will tell me at some point, because I think it's really important uh, that we have some discussion time <clears throat> afterwards. So yeah, please don't hold back uh, with your questions. Uh, I look forward to, to a stimulating discussion at the end and where we can see where it takes us. So just a brief introduction about the background. Uh, the whole idea, the motivation, of course, for sustainability transitions was that societies are now faced with persistent environmental problems, climate change, obviously, biodiversity, resource problems. And I think we can and I also add pandemics, which are a symptom of uh, unsustainable interaction between human society and nature. More generally, this means that incremental change in business as usual will not be enough to address, and we really need transitions to new kind of systems in energy, transport, food, and housing. So not only incremental change, although that remains important, but really uh, shifts to new kind of systems. That's the background of uh, the, the network. So the kind of systems we are looking at, because system, of course, is a very uh, commonly used term uh, and sometimes confusing. So we are looking at socio-technical systems, which is an idea from STS, or Sociology of Innovation. So we look at what, what, are the, what, what do you need, what elements do you need to fulfill societal functions like mobility, heating, food provision. And it's a whole cluster of elements, as you see in this representation for transport. It's, it's, it's technology, so a car, but also fuel infrastructure, markets, industry, maintenance network, regulations, road infrastructure, and cultural meanings. It's, it's this cluster of elements together that form a socio-technical system. And that system, many systems have been around, of course, since at least the Second World War and before that, and they're deeply locked in now. And for sustainability problems, we need to change the existing systems to more sustainable ones. And that requires changing many of these elements. All those, all those elements you can link to particular actors. And of course, the specific kind of actors and their specific roles is slightly different for each uh, system. So slightly different for food than it is for electricity than it is for transport. But these are some of the main social groups, uh, companies in the middle, uh, users, societal groups, policy and public authorities, research, the supply chain. And I just looked in my 2002 paper that also had finance as a special group in, in, in the left-hand corner. And I, I do now think uh, that this is actually, you know, since the financial crisis, uh, but also now with, with where we really need a lot of money, finance is a really important special group that we should also study in transition studies and, and actually is being studied more and more frequently. So then the last point that we had, we had the system, we had actors, but also we have institutions and rules. And, and this is also a picture from my 2004 paper which says that the actors at the bottom are, are acting and interacting, making decisions, but these actions are, are influenced by the rule systems that they're part of. So this is the institutions, the institutional settings that they're part of, and this is a continuous recursive uh, process. So again, this is also a picture from 2004. 
socio-technical transitions involves looking at three interrelated dimensions. So I, I showed you a picture of the socio-technical systems, which is all, let's say, the tangible elements. They, they, you also need to look at the, the human actors, the, the various groups that I just showed you, because ultimately it's their actions and reactions to each other that make change happen, but also drive stability. Uh, and that is shaped by rules and institutions, and, and which of course, you know, uh, guides the structure that people are working under. And it's really the interaction between the system, the rules, and the and the actors that, that one needs to study. So some of the behaviors that inform some of the basic MLP concepts, you probably will know, or may have seen this sort of static uh, picture. So we're interested in the middle level. How can we change existing systems from one system or regime to another one? From the bottom, uh, we have niche innovations, which are uh, the, the radical innovations that are the seed of uh, transitions to sustainability. And that can be car sharing or electric vehicles or alternative foods. Uh, and they're struggling, they're, they're, they're usually emerging in the periphery in small niches and they want to break through, but they're struggling against this deeply locked in existing system. And this struggle is being played out and, and influenced by the wider landscape so I've got one slide on each of these uh, levels. Again, I won't go in any depth, but, but one of the problems is not only looking at niches, but some of the basic problem is also stability. You know, transitions are ultimately about stability and change. And the problem, of course, is that the existing system, which has been there for a long time, is, is locked in and path dependent and resistant to change. And in various literatures, here you've got the economic, social, and, and polit political literatures, you have causal mechanisms that help explain the stability. So these can be vested interests or sunk investments or just scale advantages and low costs, but also cognitive routines and also opposition and, and, and power. So there's a whole range of literatures that, that emphasize or that, that analyze different kinds of causal mechanisms that help explain why systems do not change radically, but more incrementally over time. So the second level is the, the niche level that explains more where do radical innovations come from because they all uh, are emerging from somewhere and then you can track the development over time. And the idea is that innovations initially emerge in the periphery. This is also an idea from evolutionary theory. Uh, and they cannot immediately compete on mainstream markets because usually the price performance characteristics are much lower than the existing technology. So Joel Moki called these hopeful monstrosities. So how can these hopeful monsters emerging in niches, how can they uh, emerge and how can they develop over time and gain momentum to overthrow the existing regime? That's, that's basically the core puzzle, I think, of transition studies. All this struggle is situated by a wider landscape, which you can either, there are slow changing secular trends, you know, demographics, macroeconomics, ideology, but also climate change, I think, but you also have shocks, of course, the oil shock, the recession, recessions, wars, and now, of course, also the pandemic, which can really shape, uh, change the whole selection environment in which niches and regimes uh, interact with each other. So when you put this all together, all together in a more dynamic sense, and also you, you see this unfolding over time. So the radical innovations emerging in the, in the left-hand corner, there's a lot of variety and flux and variation uh, going on, lots of trial and error, also lots of failure, uh, which is struggling against the existing regime, which is not entirely inert, but incrementally developing over time, as represented with these straight uh, horizontal lines. And then there's the broader landscape level, which usually tends to evolve uh, much more slowly, so what Brodel calls uh, the longer durée. Uh, and for this transition to, well, I, I think many of you will have seen this picture, so I won't spend a lot of time. But the basic story is <clears throat> radical innovations emerge in small niches. There's a prolonged period of experimentation and learning and the building of networks and the articulation of visions. It can easily take 20 to 30 years, but then gradually it stabilizes. Uh, there's more agreement about where to go. The visions become clearer. The price goes down, the performance becomes better. So then you get the struggle in, in, the, in the second and the third phase. How does it diffuse and how does it get into the existing system? And usually that involves also external pressures on the regime, which tend to overcome these deep-seated lock-ins and, and uh, path dependencies. So these pressures then open up the regime, as you can see with those little arrows in the middle of the picture. 
that then creates windows of opportunity and then those niche innovations can break through more widely and replace the existing regime. So that's in a, <clears throat> in a nutshell uh, the, the core narrative of transition. Of course, and as I will, I will show that later, this has been nuanced and differentiated, but the basic idea is you've got niche innovations and so the radical innovations, which can be business model innovations like car sharing, it can be social innovations, it can also be technological innovation. So it, it doesn't have to be you know, purely uh, technologically focused. But the core idea is there are, there are struggles on multiple dimensions between the, the emerging radical innovations and the existing regime. So on the business dimension, you often have to struggle between new companies, new entrants and incumbents. On the economic dimension, you've got basically market competition between the gray and the green, and it's, and it's often an uneven playing field. You know, it's, it's stacked often against the green innovations. There are political struggles between the existing elites, if you will. So that's often the politicians and big firms struggling versus the, the, the niche actors, which can be cities, social movements, green entrepreneurs. And on the cultural dimension, you also have ongoing struggles, which is more about discourse and framing. And it really matters if we frame the sustainability problem as a market failure, as many economists do, or if we, or if we talk more about planetary boundaries, which is of course a new uh, framing, then of course sustainability transitions become much more uh, uh, pertinent. So uh, since, I mean, the, the, these basic ideas have been developed some time ago, as Julia said, uh, start in, starting in the 2000s. So there was a first wave of transition studies, which established the basic concepts, did exploratory case studies. And now there's also been a second wave, I think since about the mid 2000s, when we have more case studies, but also uh, cr criticisms on the, on the basic ideas have led to conceptual elaborations. So in the remainder of my presentation, I'll just briefly go through some of them. You know, I, I'll, I'll probably get time enough to talk about the first six. I'm not sure I have enough time to also talk about the other three. And you know, even this is just a selection because I think that the nice thing of the MLP is it has, you know, it's an op quite an open framework. And it allows you also to ask new kinds of questions. So I, I, I think that's one of the strengths that it's been actually quite generative in opening up new research uh, streams which has led to new discussions and ongoing debates uh, and further differentiations. So maybe that's what we can talk about in the question and answer session. So I'll start with talking, uh, well, go through the first six, then see how far I am with time, and then we can do uh, question and answers. So the, the, the narrative I just gave you was, is, is, a, is a standard narrative, basically of technological substitution where the new replaces the old. But since 2007, but then also later 2016, and here below, for, e for each of these new research streams, I've added a range of uh, uh, references as a service to, uh, to the network. So people that are interested in one or more of these research streams can do at least have a starting point with some references that they can start to read about. So there's a whole literature about pathways now uh, Rosenblum wrote about this, uh, this about empirical pathways in the various domains. Uh, but the pathways I'll briefly talk about now are a further differentiation of this basic idea of technological substitution. And, and that there are also other ways of having large uh, uh, sustainability change. So technological substitution is basically the, the niche innovations emerge and, and we get a lot of substitution primarily on the technological dimension and then maybe some spillovers to the other dimension. So if we talk about battery, battery electric vehicles, that's clearly a technology So it, it, that is now beginning to diffuse and we see some substitution happening. And of course, that's then triggering further changes in infrastructure because you need recharging. It may also change user preferences, how people drive. It may lead to new cultural meanings. But it is really the idea of the one going up, electric vehicles in this example, and the other going down, petrol cars. And this is then often you know, facilitated by a specific shock where if you look at the renewables in Germany, they were emerging for a long time, then you get the Fukushima shock, and all of a sudden you get the energy vendor as a formal policy and, and the diffusion goes, goes faster. This, this is how many economists also in particular think about transitions as basically a substitution story. But we differentiated this in our 2007 paper and later also in 2016. You can also have quite a lot of change in the existing regime by the existing actors gradually reorienting their direction by changing the search routines, changing their investment strategies, changing the institutional logics. 
and then gradually with small changes over time if you do it long enough you get a lot of you can get a lot of improvement over time and if you do this over 30 40 year periods the existing regime may actually look quite different than the one you you began with although there's never been a substitution it's, it's a much more gradual transformation uh, endogenous endogenously enacted the third pathway is reconfiguration where it's not new against old it's actually the, <clears throat> the the radical innovations emerging in niches being incorporated into the existing system and then from there on triggering further further uh, learning processes and knock-on effects and may even change the entire entire architecture of the system so you might think renewables are being incorporated into the renewal into the electricity system and are now changing the basic architecture in terms of a shift from centralized to decentralized. We need to change uh, the grids in terms of backup capacity and storage, and also that uh, there are more bi-directional flows in the whole electricity grid. So something that starts as basically technological substitution in, or, 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 or partial substitution in the system can lead to all kinds of knock-on effects. And this is, more, uh, this, is, this is a pattern where new actors and old actors work together. So it's more normal new alliances rather than overthrow. And then the last one, which is maybe particularly uh, relevant now with the Corona crisis, is de-alignment and realignment, where major landscape pressures create such a major shock on the systems that the systems really destabilize, uh, begin to fall apart, and that then creates basically a lot of open space for various niche innovations to emerge. And then we need to wait and see which one uh, will win and will lead to a new realignment of the of the regime. So I'm sure we could probably talk later about what the coronavirus means in terms of these pathways, because you know it's not only it's not only a single shock, it's gonna to lead to a recession, it's gonna to lead to a whole range of other knock-on effects. And I think we still need to wait and see if it actually will destabilize. It's currently, of course, is destabilizing the systems, but if this will be a permanent destabilization or if it will actually restabilize around the status quo. And of course you see a lot of uh, incumbent actors are pushing just for getting back to the status quo. So the second, so the, I think that whole idea of pathways is one big research area, which is, which is attracting a lot of attention. I think a second one is, is a more nuanced view of interactions between niches and regimes. And there's been quite a literature going back to 2007, Adrian Smith, who came up with some interesting mechanisms. So for instance, selective translation, that the incumbent players may selectively incorporate aspects of niche innovations into their existing regime. And he gave some examples of supermarkets, which initially did not have organic food, but then they, you know, they see this as a growing market. So the existing supermarkets started adopting the idea of organic food into their, into their regime, but more as a new product rather than a wider, rather than a wider, and not as a wider system transformation. Smith and Raven uh, wrote a whole interesting paper about empowerment. So what niche actors do to try to actively change regime rules and they further distinguish between fit and stretch patterns. Uh, other, other way of nuance in the niche regime interaction are collaborations between new entrants and incumbents, but also the political struggles over institutional change. And sometimes that you have countervailing power from other regimes. So you've got, for instance, some of the ICT companies, you know, which are big incumbent players in ICT, the Googles and, and, and those kind of players, they're moving in, into other regimes and, and, therefore, and thereby stimulating the niches. So they, they're moving into car manufacturing, into, into automotive, and they're moving into renewables. So I think there's a whole set of, and I've got some, some references at the bottom here, a whole set of more interesting mechanisms of how niches and regimes interact with each other. So then there's been a, this issue of agency and micro foundations. There's been a, you know, a long-standing criticism from some people, and it's often repeated, that there's no agency in the MLP. I've always been surprised by this criticism because if, if you look at the case studies, they're full of actors working in, you know, as I showed earlier, you've got social technical systems, actors and rules. So this, you know, the, the whole notion of actors has been there from, from the start. The case studies are also full of actors interacting and learning and struggling with each other. And in our 2010 paper, we also further clarified, as you see in this picture on the, on the bottom, that you've got different theories, you know, structuration theory and institutional theory that we mobilize to talk more about the interaction between rules and actors. 
re really mobilize ideas from STS or sociology of technology to again look at how actors shape technologies and we also mobilize ideas from evolutionary economics. So these are the three I think main conceptual pillars that, that inform the MLP uh, and particularly institutional theory, STS and evolutionary economics. So in this paper that, that Julius just mentioned, so in, in 2020, I wrote this paper on the micro foundations of the MLP because you know, I wanted to put this idea to bed that the, the MLP doesn't have uh, agency or doesn't do agency. So I really recommend if, if you're interested in this topic that you, that you read this, this paper, it goes quite at foundational level uh, to how actors are uh, conceptualized in the MLP. That does not mean that any possible kind of actor or agency is, is, is conceptualized, but it's of course any theory selects particular kind of causal mechanisms. So from STS, STS is particularly focusing so on the left corner on social cognitive mechanisms, so network building, promises, expectations, learning, codification, all these things are well known. This picture here is about evolutionary economics, you know, Sociologists really misunderstand evolutionary economics. They always think it's mechanical and doesn't have actors, which of course is not true. But it does focus primarily on companies, which is on the left-hand side, which are characterized with either routines, or operating procedures and technical capabilities. And uh, that leads to particular search activities. You know, that's all about actions. Then of course, yeah, you do get market selection, which you might say is sort of a, a, a not personal mechanism but then the, the outcomes of market selection need to be interpreted again, and, and that then leads to replication or adjustment in routines. So evolutionary economics, okay, you know, it focuses on money and it focuses on, on skills and learning. It does, they've got a, a selective view of agency, but there, are cert, there is certainly agency even in evolutionary economics. And then this picture on the bottom is how I conceptualized uh, interactions, recursive interactions between institutions and actors which is basically an evolutionary idea of uh, structural conditioning, then actors do things and then they replicate or adjust uh, the institutions. So the, the paper I mentioned goes one level deeper by distinguishing different ontologies. And of course, you, once you talk about agency, the, I mean, agency, just like structure and culture, is one of the most difficult debates in social science. So you, know, you need to be really careful when you're going into this domain because it, it's full of pit holes and, and it's, it's a really challenging area. So I try to distinguish you know, different ontologies by making this two by two matrix of uh, individualist assumptions or collectivist and then also subjective and objective. And that leads to different kind of basic ontologies like rational choice, conflict and power, structuralism and interpretivism. And then within that you have speci specific theories so the MLP, as I tried to explain before, is based on these three theories, evolution economics, institutional theory, and STS. And here I place them in particular areas of, of, of the foundational ontologies and show how there are some interactions. So there, there definitely is agency in the MLP, even through these three theories. But as I said, you know, that's not, there are more ways in which you can conceptualize agency and, and more elaborations have been made and are still being made with regard to power and political economy, cultural meanings and discursive struggles. There's a massive field, of course, on business studies and strategic management, which has a lot to say about agency and of course also social psychology. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. It's a really interesting uh, debate and I'm, I'm really also quite willing if you wanted to talk about that more. So I'll just say a bit more about other recent debates and you know, not in any depth, but just to flag it up to you that these are some of the areas where the MLP is, is, is being uh, elaborated in interesting ways. So there's a lot more debate now on, on politics in, in, in transitions, because obviously I, I mentioned that the rules and institutions and standards are really uh, crucial because they shape markets and they stimulate innovation. But of course, these there are deep struggles about what these institutions are like. Um, so there are struggles between the niche actors and the regime actors, because as I said, usually the rules and institutions are really favored to the existing regime. And, and not, it's not a level playing field. So one of the struggles that you will have to do as a niche actor is to try to change the institutions. And here are, quite, here, here are some papers that are trying to do that. So Jochen Market has written about this and so have I with, with, uh, with Roberts. There's a big literature on institutional entrepreneurship that can be mobilized. There's a whole literature now emerging on policy mixes. Uh, and 
Kern and Rocha wrote a really good uh, overview paper, which I would really recommend to you if, if you're interested in policy process theories. So they talk about you know, multiple streams models, uh, garbage can models, policy network models. There's a whole range of theories in political science that we can mobilize and to understand the political struggles uh, in transitions. Also really active debate is about culture, cultural meanings in particular and discursive struggles. So that's about, you know, the, mean, the, the struggles are not only about products and markets and politics, but also about sense making. And sense making really is important because it shapes meanings and therefore also cultural legitimacy. And there was a nice paper, very nice paper by Hermville, which I've got at the bottom there, Hermville 2016, which shows that Fukushima, the ex accident in 2011, was interpreted very differently in Japan, Germany and, and the United Kingdom framed in different terms, interpreted in different terms, and that had really different kind of political uh, circumstances, uh, consequences. So in Germany, it was really seen as a confirmation that nuclear power is a, is a lethal threat. Whereas in the UK, it was just framed as well, you know, the Japanese had a different design and they don't manage their reactors very well, so we don't need to worry about it. So I'm just, I'm just saying this to, to show that, that cultural meanings and discursive struggles really are influential and consequential for how transition unfolds. And there's a lot of literature on this. Again, I've got some at the bottom. Discursive struggles in the media is important. How landscape shocks are interpreted. I already gave you the example of Fukushima, but of course now the same is going on with, with uh, the coronavirus. You know, how are we interpreting and framing this? Also interesting is the whole delegitimation of existing regime regimes. So the whole Dieselgate scandal in Germany, of course, has really deeply discredited Volkswagen, but also quite a couple of because it was not only Volkswagen, also a range of other car companies. And it's really, in the UK, led to a massive sales drop in diesel cars and, and, you know, and, and companies saying we're going to phase out diesel and petrol cars. So the, the negative storylines that, that help delegitimate existing regimes are also a really important, interesting topic for us to, uh, to study. And have been done again, have been done in the MLP. Business struggles. As I already mean, this is huge literature that is increasingly being mobilized because business and management is a, is a massive field, of course. Uh, and we are increasingly going beyond the, the simple Schumpeterian dichotomy in which the incumbents are the bad guys, you know, and they are just stupid and they're just incremental and locked in. And the green guys, you know, they're the good ones and they are doing all the radical innovation, the new entrants. And that's, that's sometimes the case, but it's too simple and it's definitely not always the case. There are lots of niche innovation being developed by incumbents. So there's a whole literature that has a strategic reorientation of incumbents towards niche innovations. Of course, the, the battery electric vehicles are partly done by new entrants like Tesla, but also by the existing car companies, as, as an example. But there's also all literature on corporate political strategies. So the incumbents, you know, they don't always actively reorient. They also try to resist and slow down and delay the transition as much as they can because they, they can gain billions uh, by this. So that's, that's the whole literature of corporate political strategies, what they do to influence policymakers by paying them, by sitting on committees, by threatening to close down factories, all these kind of things. And of course, these strategies are now heavily being played out with the whole coronavirus and their, their active bailout strategies uh, are really actively going on right now. How much money is going to go you know, to the green innovations and how much is going to go to basically propping up the car companies, the aviation companies, the oil industry. So these corporate political strategies is a really interesting and important area for research. And then new business models, again, it's a, it's a, they're often emerging niches, and, and this is also a really important area uh, to study how they gain momentum or not. So I think I, I, I won't, given time, uh, I, I won't go through these slides. So I've got another one on diffusion, which I think, you know, we need to look not only at niches and how they emerge in the early phases, but now really at how they diffuse and accelerate. I think we also need to move as a field beyond focusing only on single innovations, but really looking at multiple regimes and multiple niche innovations and how they together change the whole system. And of course, there's also a really interesting and important literature on active phase out and exnovation and destabilization, which is the flip side of transitions, which I think if we want to accelerate transitions, we actively, we will need to go more into this area because if we just focus on niche innovations, it's going to go too slow. So my final remarks, I think the MLP, as, as Julia said, has become one of the central transition frameworks in, in research. 
there was a first wave of transition theories and concepts based on the MLP in the early 2000s. You know, they, they established the basic concepts and they did exploratory case studies to show the validity of this framework in many historical cases, but also applications to the present. That led to various criticisms and also a second wave, I think, since the, since the mid 2000s. And I you know, gave you some of the themes there and some of the references, the important references that are being that are deepening and systematizing the MLP. Uh, they are doing more focused case studies, they do comparative case studies, and also I think really interestingly, they're mobilizing much more systematically insights from a wide range of social science theories, you know, cultural studies, discourse theory, business studies, political science. Uh, I think this, that's, this is really what has led to better understandings, interesting debates, uh, and there's a lot of momentum to be gained from doing that further. So overall, I think this is really now has led to the MLP becoming a cumulative uh, interdisciplinary research program uh, that continues to attract a lot of attention. Uh, I'm now working in the IPCC, but, but there's lots of academics and they all are aware of this, of this area, even though it's, it's not their main specialty. So it's getting a lot of interest is also in other disciplines. And I think quite satisfyingly, there's now increasing real world uptake also by policymakers. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the European Environment Agency is very active in this area, the OECD, the Innovation Agency of the European Commission, uh, the Energy Transitions Commission, but also a range of NGOs are picking up the MLP. Uh, it's a forum for the future, uh, smart CSOs, they're, they're all taking this framework to really understand the struggles that are going on and, and that are beginning to transform the existing systems in many domains. I'm sure there are still all kinds of problems uh, with the MLP, but I've always been inspired by this quote from Collins, uh, which says that problems are more important structurally than solutions, and that they can, must, they can better muster the energy and interest of a community of intellectuals. And I think that's really maybe one of the strengths of the whole MLP discussion, that it started with ideas, it gets criticized, that then leads to further thinking and elaboration and, and, and new ideas. And I, I think that's the spirit that I've always really liked uh, in SGRN and, and one of them myself also trying to contribute uh, to and I, I hope uh, you will also hopefully engage in that kind of spirit. So thanks for your attention and uh, let's start the discussion.